Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 410, the final YMYW of 2022. What's more important, choosing low-cost index funds or diversifying investments even if it means paying higher fees? What causes mutual fund price fluctuation? Are mid-cap funds necessary in a balanced portfolio? The fellows also talk about real estate funds versus real estate investment trusts and annuities versus bonds in a retirement portfolio. Finally, we revisit some investing strategy questions from earlier in the year that are still relevant in today's volatile markets on moving to cash, analyzing your asset allocation, and rebalancing your retirement portfolio. Visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Ask Joe and Big Al on air to send in your money questions for 2023. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Now ask Joe and Al, you can write us an email or you can leave a message right there on our lovely website. Hi, Joe, Big Al, and Andy. This is Matt from Virginia. I absolutely love your show and have learned so much over the past year, and I can't thank you enough. I drive a Honda Accord and love a cold Modella. Here's my question. What is more important diversification or low fee index funds. I have a 403B and my income is too high to contribute to a Roth IRA. I know you prefer low cost index funds. However, my plan only offers two index funds, an S&P 500 and a total bond market. The international is a class A fund with a fee of about 80 basis points. The small and mid cap are active funds and are no load but they still have a fee of about 90 basis points. Is it worth it to diversify, or do you think I should just think about staying with the index funds? All right, Matt from Virginia. Yeah, usually we'd like to diversify and have low cost, but it seems it's one or the other here. Yeah. So what? Well, maybe what? What's Class A fund? Maybe you can explain that off the right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is for our listeners. <laughs> uh, well, a Class A is a, a loaded fund, but they waive the the load, so it's probably like a American funds or something like that. Okay. So before, you know, I I don't even know if people can purchase class A mutual funds anymore. It's like a 5.75% upfront load. Right. So do they have uh, the back end fees too? No, no, just no. the front end. Yeah. The, the cheapest fund of, of any type of commission fund, A shares, B shares, C shares, A, you just pay it up front and then yeah. you got the lowest internal costs. Um, okay. So, but this is way below. I, I, would, I think this is his four or three B plan. So, okay. Um, what do you think? So index funds, just go with the bond fund or the S&P 500? Well, I like those two. I think that's a good start. I, I would like to have international if if, uh, if if I were Matt. So I would I would probably add international. I might skip the other two because I don't really like active funds that much. But that's probably what I would do. I'd probably add international and, and with those three funds, call it good. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I think he's he's splitting hairs here. I mean, it's it's not huge fees 80 basis points i mean it's not the end of the world yeah and and the thing about it with international it tends to zig and zag at different times than the u.s market and the last decade u.s has done better which the next decade will international do better who knows but it does tend to kind of catch up with it with with each other over time and if i was warren buffett i would just say the index funds because that's what he told his wife yeah well true the billions of dollars that he's going to give to his wife when he dies is, yeah but what, what, funds. what would you do i, I would diversify fully would you? so i wouldn't care about you know, if you yeah, have small cap and some of that, it's a little active. I don't care. Okay. If, if that's my only choice that I have, I want a fully diversified portfolio. Right. Um, so if I'm going to pay a little bit extra to get that diversification, I would do that all day long. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I think I would just add the international call it good. Um, yeah, it, I suppose it, it depends too on how much money Matt has, right? If it's 50 True. grand, then I would just put everything in the S and P 500. Yeah. If it's getting into 200, 500, a million dollars, then of course you would want to diversify more. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. The, the bigger the account, the more diversification matters, right? Yes, for sure. Because it's not going to be worth it because the S and P 500, you're, you're going to get a broad diversified portfolio with that S and, you know, you know, with that index fund. Yeah. And so if you're, you know, putting a few thousand dollars in this fund, if you thought, I mean, then that doesn't make any sense either. So um, I think it depends on the size of the overall account. 
And, um, but overall, if he just wanted to go index funds, I think you're totally fine there too. Yeah. Uh, but if it were me, if this was my money, I would probably want a little bit more diversification. Got it. Okay. Because smaller caps are, are going to outperform the S&P 500, even with the weighted fee over time, because over time. it's more risky. Yeah, true. The, my only hesitation is active. And now you're trusting a manager to try to figure out which ones to pick. True. But. They're still broadly diversified. I mean, basically, actively managed mutual fund managers are almost like the dinosaur. You, you know, they're, to find it. they're they're going extinct. I mean, if you look at actively managed funds, I think over the last ten years, so much flows coming out. Could you imagine being like an actively managed mutual fund wholesaler going to advisors <laughs> and saying, tough. "Hey, look at how we beat the market this yeah, year." <laughs> ever, you know, we've never. But but they're they're just closet indexers, right? So they charge a little bit extra fee, but basically they're buying the index, and they might overweight it or underweight it in a certain a little, area little of, of what they there. think. But yeah, you're right. basically buying the index fund in in, in most cases. So, um, all right, thanks for the voicemail for the or the voice recording. I should say, right? Voice recording? Yeah, yeah voice, we did that voice. right through our website. It actually right. worked. Ask Joe it now. Worked. First time. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, uh, Brent, he writes in from Bennington. Hey, gang. Something I've always wondered. How much of mutual fund day-to-day fluctuations is attributed to fluctuations of the stocks and bonds that it holds versus people buying and selling? For example, BTSAX. Isn't that Vanguard Total Stock Market? I fund? think so. That's like the biggest fund in the world. Right. A lot of money in that fund. Yeah. Has nothing to do with the trading of that fund. <laughs> yeah, because there's so much money in there. It's still, it's, it's like trying to People turn. People don't day trade the, uh, the total U.S. stock market. trying fund. to turn a cruise ship quickly. It doesn't <laughs> yes. happen. Uh, is it the share price only uh, fluctuation because of the stocks it holds, or does people buying and selling and have an impact as well? It's the same thing um, like ARKK or ARK. Thank you. Um, well, ARC is a totally different story, I believe. Isn't that, um, what's her name's fund? I, I don't know, tickers. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's probably a smaller fund, but, um, but VTSAX. So, so that's the, a giant fund. Yeah. Giant. Yeah. You're not going to, the people don't necessarily trade that fund all that often. Right. Um, it's kind of a buy and hold. It's Vanguard. It's sure. John Vogel. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that that's right. That's what, that's <laughs> His his flagship fund. That's that. That's what Warren Buffett says to get into, right? Yeah, I don't think you're going to be moving the markets by trading that fund, but the the fluctuations of that fund, in I would say, I don't know, ninety percent is probably the stocks that are yeah. that that, that, at, that fund holds. At least I I uh, just to be sure, I asked our uh, chief investment officer Brian Perry. Oh, okay. What who's a chartered say? financial analyst oh, he's and a certified financial planner? Okay. So here's what he said. He said in normal, and we got it, you got it right. All right, good. Okay. You, All right. You, you, you nailed it. In normal market environments, the price movement of the underlying stocks is going to cause the vast majority of the fund price movements, particularly for a large fund, right? Here we go. VTSAX, $290 billion in assets. That's a big one. <laughs> for somewhat smaller funds or funds that attract a lot of hot money, meaning a lot of kind of new money or money in and out, um, investors buying and selling can have a larger impact. So ARKK is likely to be more impacted by buying and selling than VTSAX. And that that's only because it's a smaller fund, right? Uh, for any fund, really bad market environments might lead to an investor exodus. Think 2008, uh, there, where there's going to be an environment of buying and selling. Uh, it might have a little uh, impact, a little more impact, at least in the short term. But as you lengthen out the time from horizon from weeks, months, or years, buying and selling are going to have very little effect. And the change in the value of the underlying security should pr- produce almost all of the change of the fund value. Wow. <laughs> we lost you. <laughs> but that's the answer. Got it. Hey, who's the, uh, the manager for ARC again? Uh, her name is Kathy, yeah, Kathy Wood. Wood. Yes. Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood. Yeah, that fund just got its butters. Lost kicked. investors more than a billion dollars before this year's wipeout. Yes, ma'am. She was like the the dream. She was uh, the miracle worker. And well, then, oh, see, boopsies. And well, that's I'm sure that's why the question yeah. came about. Yeah, and 
it's that that's a little trendy fund. That's all the cool cool guys used to yeah, you know talk about uh, Mark that's Kathy little, Wood. Little hot money. Huh? That is some hot money there, Big Al. That yeah, is, okay. but we like the BTSAX, the boring, <laughs> the big boring cruise ship. Versus we do this like people. that fund. Yeah. There are no shortage of those risky hot money schemes that seem like they're just the ticket to grow your wealth, when in reality they can completely rob you of your long term financial security. Download our new guide to growing your wealth from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com for nine basic steps to improve your finances. You'll learn the factors that impact your rate of return. One of the most overlooked aspects of the retirement plan equation, two ways to diversify your investment portfolio and much more. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes and download the guide to growing your wealth for free. We got Jeff right in from Kentucky. He goes, hello, all. I started listening to you guys a few weeks ago after a friend recommended the show. Very grateful for what you're doing. Oh. Nice. Thank you for the that, recommendation nice. to, from yeah. the friend. Nice little, little recommendation. I'm 42. Drive a 2019 GMC Canyon. Enjoy uh, you littling. <laughs> what the hell is that called again? Uh, listeners have called it yingling. Yingling, yingling, yingling. I, I was, I can't help you. That's a complete mystery to me. Yingling, um, after work. Well, I'll, I'll throw down some yinglings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it tonight. Yes. No pets at this time. Got a couple of questions regarding my sponsor's retirement plan that I love your take on. Uh, my lovely wife is employed at a large university uh, and has a TIAA for her retirement plan. On the other hand, I have Vanguard and love the choices of the low-cost index funds. Need to bounce some ideas off you regarding her fund choices. There is nothing equivalent to a total market fund. So she's dividing equities between growth and value, large and mid, small, international. Most expense ratios are about 0.3, but mid caps are around 0.77. Question number one. <clears throat> Are these mid cap funds necessary for a balanced portfolio or could we go the large cap, small cap international route for the equity portion? One just answer that real quick. <laughs> you could. Yeah, I would. I would not invest in mid cap because you, I would just load up a little bit more in small mid cap is like one of the worst performing asset classes. Well, yeah, there's not that a lot of point in it. Small tends to outperform large, but it's more volatile, right? So, but over the long term. So it's nice to have small. If you know, and we, we talked about this before a couple segments ago, is is getting diversification is great. Now, in, in certain cases, you're limited to the funds allowed by the plan, right? And if the if the choices are too expensive, like maybe mid cap, it, it's not horrible, 0.77, but but it's not a it's not great. It's not like a, what you'd like to see, you know, closer to 0.1 or or 0.2 or 0.05 maybe. Mm. But I, I'm I'm saying me personally, I do not own any mid cap. You don't? No. I mean, it turns into mid cap. The small caps turn into well, mid cap, and then it flows into large cap. Yeah, but don't you? You've got some total stock market funds that have mid cap. Yeah, but I don't have a mid cap fund. Gotcha. And yeah. If I had an option to invest in a mid cap fund, <laughs> which I do, I would not do it. <laughs> got it. Okay. Uh, I I I guess I agree with that because um, you know large companies are are more stable, right? And and so you kind of like to have plenty of those. The smaller ones have a little bit more rate of return, although it. it doesn't show up every year and yeah. it's more volatile. Those are a little more hot. Yeah, a little more hot. Yeah. Right. Right. But kind of it kind of increases the return over time. Yeah. A little a little juice, you know? Yeah. Mid mid caps are probably somewhere between yeah. I, I sort of tend to agree. Mid caps are probably less important in this mix. Yep. I, I like having growth and value. I like having small and large, and I like having international. So there you go. There you go. I agree hundred percent. All right. Question two. Do you like real estate in your in retirement portfolios? Uh, we have no real estate outside our primary residence. If so, what are your thoughts on the TIA real estate versus TIA real estate fund? The TRRSX. It appears the TIA real estate is some sort of variable annuity and year to date return is 11.05 compared to negative 27.2 on the TRSX. Um, I'm going to take a stab. I'm guessing <laughs> that the Tia real estate is probably in is like a like a true REIT, like a like a private REIT that is investing directly into real estate where the real estate fund, the Tia real estate fund TR 
or SX, sometimes they invest in real estate type companies. So they might invest in REITs, they might invest in, you know, other types of companies that are in the real estate, in the business of real estate. So those are going to be more volatile. Right. So, but the real estate fund, I, I have no idea what they're investing in. I, I would have, uh, it's probably a direct investment into real estate is my guess. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure either. I, I, I'll answer this broadly. I, I do like to have some real estate exposure, um, even in my portfolio. I have rental properties as well, but I do like some real estate exposure because my rental properties are, are individual homes right? Or condos. And when I have real estate exposure, I'm getting commercial and, and maybe apartment buildings, maybe office buildings, maybe in different locations around the country. Real estate is an asset class, right? And sometimes it outperforms other ones and sometimes it doesn't. So, so I do like that, but I, I, I tend to like the, um, uh, the, the liquid uh, real estate investment trust that you can get in and out of on a, on a daily basis. If you need to, we're, we're not really experts at the, at these two funds. So we can't really advise you on that, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the basic answer for me is yes, I do like to have some real estate in the, in the retirement accounts, uh, or non-retirement accounts, because it's just another asset class that, uh, can work well with your other asset classes. What's a, what's the holdings there? Uh, it's uh, 98% stocks. It's got uh, Prologis, American Tower REIT, Simon Property Group, Avalon Bay Communities, Equity Residential, Rexford Industrial Realty, Equinix, Public Storage, mm-hmm. Sun Communities, and Crown Castle, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, right. They're buying stocks that are yeah, going to be right. a lot more volatile. And the, the, Tila, the TIA real estate is probably a direct investment mm-hmm. into real estate. So, um, well, well, Tia Craft is an insurance company, um, just FYI. So anything that you purchase within Tia Craft is inside a shell of an annuity, um, which is not good or bad. Um, it's just that's the 403B provider. So if you want to get into the Tia real estate, I would probably do that versus the Tia real estate fund. Um, because, it, it, But you have to check the liquidity. You know, depending on can you buy and sell it, are you gonna is it illiquid or is it liquid is probably the only thing that you have to to look at. But no. So anyway, last question this guy has, um, or Jeff has, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call him this guy. He's he's Jeff from Kentucky. Wait, yeah, we know him. Yeah. Jeff. Uh last question regarding annuities. Oh, I just talked about that. I know most of the time they aren't the best choices, but Tia Traditional is a little different to my understanding. In our mandatory DCP, her illiquid portion has a guaranteed rate of 3% plus an additional 1.146 for a total of 4.146. The total liquid portion in a 403B and 457 is around 3.4%. Do you like this fund instead of bonds? What about the mixture of both? My understanding is the liquid portion could be reallocated at any time and the illiquid could be moved over 10 years or something like that if we don't choose to annuitize. Sound right? Sorry for the last question. Turned into a couple. Thanks again for looking forward to your spitball. Yeah, the TIA portion of the TIA CREF is a fixed account that is totally illiquid. Um, so you get a premium for the liquidity. So you can't move the money out. It only You can only take 10% out per year. Um, it's going to give you a little bit higher rate of return. So if you ever try to move the money out of TM, move it into your own additional, you know, traditional IRA, it's going to be hard to consolidate. So that's one negative. But it is going to give you a little bit higher premium or higher rate of return. So I do like that fund a lot uh, over bonds. Uh, but bonds are going to come back. Right. So versus going into a fixed account, I would want a little bit more liquidity, um, again, depending on what my overall goals are. And if you're going to annuitize, then go into the TIA. If not, I would probably just do a little bit of balance of both. All right. Go to your money, your dot com. Click on Ask Joe and Al on the air and we'll answer your questions uh, right here. Hey, Andy, Big Al, and newlywed Joe from Minnesota, Kevin from Denver via South Dakota, with a question regarding cash inside a deferred retirement account. I recently switched jobs and moved money from the 401k to my traditional IRA. When I did that, everything landed in a money market settlement fund. I reallocated most of the cash into uh, similar stock investments in my 401k, but I stopped short of moving the remaining cash to a bond fund. My desire is to retire in about four years, and my plan was to have a couple years of cash 
to ride out you know, a market like we're experiencing today. I've got an emergency fund, but I, I don't see that as being the same thing as holding cash inside a retirement account to ride out you know, these tough times. So my question is, when, if ever, does it make sense to move to cash inside a retirement account leading up to retirement? Based upon my calculations, it would be about a 5% allocation in cash upon retirement. As always, appreciate your noodling on my random questions. Peace out. Time for a barrel stout. I just wanted to jump in real quick and mention the fact that Joe and Big Al spitball, not noodle. Noodling is somebody else. Did you hear that Minnesota accent or the? Minnesota yeah, I heard accent? some. Yep. Yeah, I loved it. Or, or South Dakota. Same, Over same, there. right? South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> living in denver now what do you think big al i mean five percent is not a huge amount so, yeah i mean i don't think it's going to make a break and he's not really trying to time the market it doesn't sound like with five percent no but but i think he i think he's asking right now he's got a bunch of money in cash probably more than five percent he wants to have five percent in retirement but but the question is should I just stay in cash or he didn't, he, he, he doesn't really want to move into bonds. And I, I guess I don't, in some ways don't blame him because bonds in the, in the short term haven't done that well. It's just the, I guess part, part of the, the reasoning behind bonds is they, they do tend to hold their value like cash and they tend to have a better rate of return like cash in market declines, the safer bonds, the short-term bonds actually go up and it helps shelter the blow. Cash doesn't, it just sits there. But nevertheless, we're getting this question, which is, should I just skip the bonds and, and go in cash? And they do roughly the same thing, right? It's, it's safe money in your retirement account. But I'm in bonds right now because I think that's the right place to be. They do go up. They do earn more than cash. I think if he's asking the question, what to do today, I would go into bonds, but I'd, I'd have them be safer short term. In terms of in retirement, 5% is fine. I mean, that's just, just an ease of distributions, right? So you don't have to sell anything. So I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. I, I mean, if he's sitting in cash with a lot of money and he's trying to time it out and write it out over these tough times is what he's saying. But the, the definition of tough times is on the flip side, a really good time to invest, True. right? True. Because if, 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 if he thinks it's tough times now because the market's down 20%, and so is it better to invest in good times when the market's up 20%? So you got to be thinking kind of almost in opposite world, George Costanza, you know, <laughs> um, when you invest your money. Because I think intuitively we're really bad investors because, I mean, there's two things that people are doing right now, right? It's like, okay, do I hold the course or do I go on cash or try to time the market to ease the pain that way, right? That, those are two of your options. And they're both very difficult to do because if I just hold the course, even though that's probably the better option, but you're seeing your account balance go down 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever the, the number is, depending on what type of portfolio that you're in, I mean, that blows people up. They can't do it. I mean, time and time again, shows that people can't do it. So then you have a, a situation where Kevin recently changes jobs. He moves his 401k and now he's got money sitting in cash. And he's like, oh, now it would probably be a really good time to keep it in cash and ride out the tough times. I mean, if, if I were looking at Kevin's overall portfolio, I would say, well, okay, well, what is the appropriate balance that he should have to accomplish his goals and have that invested right now today? Yeah. But, but Joe, he said, he said, I reallocated most of the cash into similar stock investments. Yeah. But he's writing some stuff out in the tough times. I don't know what that means. Well, it, yeah, it either means exactly what you said, or it means what I said. I guess we don't know. My presumption was he had some bonds in his retirement account, and he didn't want to reinvest in bonds because they haven't done that well lately. So, who, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I think, whatever, we both give a little different color to this question. <laughs> True. How you invest should be based on how much risk you're willing to take, how much money you have now, how much you'll need to spend in retirement, and many other factors. So what's best for you is going to be completely different than what's best for Kevin or anyone else. Make a New Year's resolution to get your finances in order. 
Schedule a free, one-on-one, personalized financial assessment with an experienced financial professional on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors to get that ball rolling. Pure is a fee-only fiduciary, which means, number one, legally they must act in the client's best interest, and number two, they don't earn commissions and they won't sell you investments of any kind. Don't leave your entire retirement future up to a spitball. Work with a professional to create a comprehensive financial plan that's tailored to your specific needs and goals. It'll carry you through the good times and the tough times. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes, then click free financial assessment. Hey, Andy, Joe, Big Al, thanks for your great comments on previous questions. And thanks for keeping the typical boring topic of finance fun. That's what we do. That's what we try to do. Make it fun of finance. I determined that a 70-30 stock bond fund is right for me. I'm really struggling with determining the right mix of international to keep in my equity mix. There's a, a seemingly knowledgeable sources are all over the board from 50-50 to 100-0. I've targeted the following mix and would appreciate your comments. 30% bonds, 47% domestic stocks. Out of the domestic stocks, he's going to go 75 large. 11 mid, 14 small, 23% international. So 85 developed, 15% emerging. Am I on track? Brian from Albany. Craft IPA or cheap white wine? No pets. I think he's fine. I mean, am I on track? What? Do, I don't know if you're on track or not. Well, I mean, yeah. Do I like your portfolio? Sure. Yeah, the... the- Appropriate question, is this a reasonable portfolio for 70-30 stock bond mix? And I would say you're spot on. I, sure. I, I wouldn't probably change anything. Yeah, that's fine. I I I I, I would per- say spot on. I think it's spot on. I would say it's it's fine. <laughs> it's well, at least it, at least I'll I'll answer it this way. This this is how this is probably similar to what I would do in my portfolio uh if I want to do 70 30. I yeah. can say I can say that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So I I like the idea of having twice as much domestic as international. I think that's a good ratio. Is it the only ratio? No. Some people do zero. Some people do 50-50. But I like it. Yeah, right? two-thirds, one-third. And and I would do more developed international than emerging, but I like emerging markets. And I would, just by definition, you're going to be doing more large companies than mid and small mid, small com- mid and small companies, mid, small. mid, mid and small. <laughs> Because there's there's more dollars in large companies. Yep. I don't know. Then oh, which how much is in value versus well we didn't growth. yeah, we didn't say that. We, yeah. could, we could go down to that level. Brian, I think you have a lot of knowledgeable sources and they all are all over the board. Yeah. Because you want to make it specific to yourself. You know what I mean? You want to build a portfolio based on what your risk tolerance is, what target rate of return that you want to generate, how much money do you have, how much is what's the demand for the portfolio and everything else. Sure. So you want to craft it, but if if you're looking at a generic 60, 40, 70, 30, or whatever 70, 30. portfolio, yeah, I think that's, that, that's and, the and, one, the, right? and the 70, 30 portfolio is probably fine with someone that has several years to let it grow. What's, um, God, what was that book? Dan, Dan, Dan Solon. Yes. He was on, the, that was the, the perfect portfolio. The only the investment, only, the only investment book you'll ever need, I think is what it was called. Or the only portfolio you'll ever need or. Yeah, the only investment book you'll ever need. I think so. Yeah, I would look at that because then he gives different types of portfolios. It's a quick read. It's pretty good. So let's go here. Joe, Al, and Andy, thank you for your podcast. It helps us make better decisions as my wife and I transition to retirement. This is Mick from Davis, California. We are both 65. I'm mostly retired from my career as a clinical social worker. I used to specialize in children and their families. Now I support graduate students, social workers, and their field placements and do ethic consultations for colleagues on a very part-time basis. My wife is a serial entrepreneur. Pretty close, huh? Pretty close. <laughs> yeah, I think you only missed one R. I'll accept it. Um, I, I knew what you meant. Got it. Who now works full-time by serving on company boards and consulting with startups. Feels like I'm reading a bio. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of big words here. <laughs> killed Mick, come on, you're killing me. Just ask me a, a question already. Hey, you and asked for the details. He's got details. I love the for details. You. No, I'm, I'm just diving in. This is like really complicated stuff, though. 
In our almost 45 years of marriage, we have always had one cat and two dogs. Currently, our 16-year-old cat is more aloof than ever since we both started working from home. (laughs) I wonder why. (laughs) Uh, um, Our small 12-year-old Heinz 57 dog, Daisy, uh, still runs every morning with my wife and snuggles in the evening. We adopted our six-year-old half Pekingese. 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 (laughs) Pekingese guard dog, Nutmeg, during the pandemic. Who knew that Pekingese were guard dogs? (laughs) Car-wise, I drive an original two-seater, three-cylinder, 68-mile-per-gallon, 2003 Honda Insight. Wow. And my wife enjoys her 2021 Kia, a Nero plug-in hybrid. All right. little Kia plug-in. Uh, we barely drink. Yeah, because you just write. <laughs> you just, he needs to keep clear just, in his writes, writing. He just writes letters. <laughs> and just not, Every night. And it's just like the, the specificity. The, the, the specificity. <laughs> that, word? that was the great. Specifics, <laughs> the specifics is just, yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> on Friday night, we share a boot amber ale. Boot. You ever had a little boot? Uh, no. no, I've, had I've never Amber even Ale. heard of that one. <laughs> but anyway, so they do drink on uh, Friday nights. Yeah, well, they, Friday night. They share a beer. Yeah, they share a beer. Yep, yes. got it. And then he, perfect. <laughs> I have concerns about the 35% bond component of our $6 million retirement savings. Usually when the stock market goes down, the, bar, the bond market is flat to slightly up, so I can rebalance and buy more stocks on the dips. This time, the bond funds seem to dip at the same time as the stock market. So when I rebalance on the dip, should I sell the bond funds? with a higher five-year duration? Or is this similar to selling um, the total stock market and replacing it with a value fund? Should I try to keep the same range of bond fund duration, ultra low to moderate, that I started with before this year's stock and bond dips, or switch to all ultra low money markets until we get back to the 2008 interest rates? And as we approach a bear market, should we consider our allocation and shift from 65-35 to 70-30? We appreciate your spitball and informed opinions. Thank you and take care. And And I added, he's got his little bicycle there. Yeah, what is that? That is part of his signature, and it's all in Uh, characters. That's pretty cool. Little PhD, PhD, MBA. Right. That's a, get way what, smarter. What than, a combo. Than both of us combined. Mickey's, Such that he can actually draw a bicycle in text. Just that is, um, it, so Mickey, you should be doing the show. His name's Mick, not Mickey. I'm calling him Mickey. Oh, got it. We, we go way back. We're Cal- <laughs> California Californians. <laughs> yeah. And I knew he was smart. Just reading this little <laughs> email here. Okay. So good question. So he's he's got a 60-40 or 70-30 split, whatever. It doesn't necessarily matter. But what he's realizing this year is that it's like, wait a minute. When when stocks go down, usually my bonds stay flat or they go up a little bit. Sure. And that, that's usual. Right? right. It's called negatively correlated. Sure. And so when that happens, you can sell the bonds and you can rebalance and buy more stocks. Or right. vice versa. Right. Or stocks go up and you're like, okay, or maybe small companies go down and large companies go up. You sell large companies, buy more small, sure. right? You're selling high and buying low. Yeah. But w- he's looking at his portfolio and you know, he's like, everything's down. Everything's low. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> what the hell do I do now? <laughs> My whole strategy is out the window. Right. So I would be careful with any type of quick movements in this environment. Because let's say if he already has moderate or or somewhat high duration bond funds, I mean those bond managers are still holding the bonds. When they come to maturity, it's going to come back, right? So you got to be careful if you're you know selling low and trying to shift your strategy just because you're looking at timing and thinking, all right, well when interest rates get back to this level, I'd be careful with that type of thinking. If you have asset classes that you want to rebalance, but if everything is down, you know, then it's like, okay, well, what is the, what, what is your overall strategy? What is the money for? Then you might got to rethink your overall financial plan. So I would change my investment strategy based on my planning and income needs versus a rebalance strategy. Yeah. And I think the other thing that people do is maybe they'll have 
you know, just two or three, four investments. Maybe they have a total stock market fund. Maybe they got an international fund. Maybe they have a bond fund. And all three of those are down right now. Now, if you had a little bit more, maybe you had a small and value fund and an emerging markets fund, these are going to probably move a little bit differently. And then you actually can rebalance and take advantage of lower prices, ones that have gone down more than other ones, which will likely over the long term recover. So that might be something to do. I, I also agree with you. You do have to be careful because everyone wants to make changes during markets like this. And the whole point is to do your financial planning beforehand so that you know you'll be fine when this happens. And we all know it's going to happen. This is not unusual. And in fact, it, it was, I think, 2008, where every single asset class went down. It's not normal, but it, it happens. And that's the, the environment we're in. Yeah. And I, and I agree with his analogy. It's like, I don't know if I would want to sell my my bond funds with a higher five-year duration and buy you know, ultra short at this point, you already bought the risk. There's a reason why you get a higher expected rate of return in certain asset classes, just because there's more risk involved. And as markets go down, right, you bought that risk because you, you're anticipating the higher expected return in the future. Right. So is, should I sell that and buy something else? Is it like selling a value fund and buying a total U.S. stock market fund? Yeah, kind of. I think so. And you're buying on the dips. I would have a more calculated strategy on my rebalance. When am I going to rebalance and how am I going to look at it? And what percentage does it needs to deviate for me to make a move, right? But looking at this... <laughs> I have I have no idea what else to say here because I, I have no idea what he has. <laughs> yeah, we just know what kind of beer he likes on Friday. All right. Thank you, Mike, or Mick, and the little bicycle guy. Um, we got uh, <laughs> Chris writes in, straight out of Austin. Nice. Hi, Andy. Just heard Big Al and Joe debate my one in two Z financial scenarios. Uh, I can't believe. Oh, I can't, can't begin. begin to tell you how much it helped to listen to both of the sides of my scenario, even though it was admittedly long. Yes, it was very long, Chris. <laughs> that was the question. As, as usual, <laughs> uh, you all do it priceless. Um, I want to take the time to thank all of you for the common sense approach to thinking through these financial situations. P.S. It's funny. It's always exciting to hear your question being answered on the show. Then about the same time, a streak of fear comes across on what will be said. Worth it. <laughs> Still put your show up for a Rothy when it becomes a thing. Thanks again and happy trails, Chris. All right. Well, Chris, thanks for your questions. Thanks for being a loyal listener. Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that onesie. Onesie twosie. The onesie twosie. That that was a onesie. Never twosie kind of a... that question. Oh hey, I was God. gonna say it made an impact on you guys. You actually remember it because of that. We well, do. it took forty five minutes. Just <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So that's why we were long winded because it was mostly reading the question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. It, it took us four seconds. <laughs> Help us start 2023 off right by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for Your Money, Your Wealth in Apple Podcasts. You can also rate or review us on Spotify, Stitcher, Podchaser, CastBox, Podcast Addict, Good Pods, Acast, Amazon, and Audible to help new listeners find YMYW. The rules have changed, and that is the first time I've ever been able to say that, so thank you, Compliance. And thank you for being a YMYW listener. Have a happy new year, everybody. Your your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click that Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment in person at one of our seven offices around the country or online at a date and time convenient for you no matter where you are. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies that will help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision.